the third one has the most difficult part, I guess, because everything has been said and done. Um, I think you've come to the right city. This is all I want to say. Because in this city, you know, in 1990, in 1988, 1989, borders and definitions have been redefined. And I think for this, we are really in the correct city in Berlin. And this process has been going on and we are currently experiencing again how borders can be redefined in the world and how the map can be laid out anew. So there is, um, there is one very dangerous point about this redefinition and this is that you lose ground and that there is uncertainty and anarchy. Um, and this is a state that we cannot tolerate as physicians. So in a, in a certain way, um, I was in favor of of Amos by heart, because I think the definition of Parkinson's disease is wrong currently. But I certainly, as a physician, understand the point of, uh, of Tony. We have, you know, we have to give some certainty to our patients in a very uncertain world. And we have to have a pragmatic concept of Parkinson's disease uh, to treat them and to give them some comfort and some um, prognosis. Because we know that uh, there is a, a certain statistical prognosis, of course, even though the individual course of Parkinson's disease may be extremely heterogeneous. It may be different in those patients that have early cognitive impairment, early postural uh, problems. It may be different in those that have tremor-dominant Parkinson's disease. And even from a clinical standpoint, we know that the disease is very, very heterogeneous. So, uh, yes, we need probably a new definition in research. Um, we, uh, we need new definitions because this will help us to move beyond the fact that Parkinson's disease is currently viewed as a dopamine deficiency syndrome and is treated by dopamine replacement therapy. And this is all what we have. We have no disease modifying therapy. We have uh, no means uh, to basically treat based on an etiological diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. But the key problem is uh, we are dealing with a concept of Parkinson's disease what, that needs to be validated against the gold standard. And as perfectly laid out by, by Amos, there is currently no gold standard. So how do we validate basically uh, a new concept um, that will help us basically to, to give new, def new prognosis, uh, new treatment conditions to our patients? And we are currently in this transitional phase. So the moment, I personally believe, the moment that we will have a valid biomarker um, that will help us uh, to predict some of the etiopathogenetic causes of Parkinson's disease, we will redraw our lines on a solid ground, but we don't have this marker yet. People have looked at um, in vivo pathology. Skin biopsies are currently used as, uh, as a marker basically to bring diagnosis of Parkinson's disease earlier, to look at peripheral nerve, alpha synuclein uh, pathology, etc. Maybe one day we will have a better marker that we can bring earlier into the course of Parkinson's disease, which helps us to redefine these boundaries. But currently, for the sake of our patients, I think we have to stay with a concept that had, at least in clinical practice in the last 25 years, proven to be relatively correct in most of uh, you know, our predictions. So that was my uh, comment. Uh, and I think we have to, we have to vote again. No? So the question is, again, uh, is the traditional definition of PD still relevant? Yes or no? Yes is white, no is red. Red? Okay. Wow. Definitely white is uh, the best. I mean, Did a very good three job, three quarters, three quarters. <laughs> Tony. <laughs> Okay. You're right. So we, we can make a right. second vote. We need the question is, do we need to modify? But you have to also say but what for? Well that's uh, that's depends on the answer. That's a very easy debate and the beauty is we have ten minutes or so we make a second vote. Do we have to modify the diagnosis, the definition of the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease? So white is what? Yes. Yes. Yeah. White, white is yes. Red. Red no. is no. So I think this was a clear answer that we should um, 
think of the fact that we perhaps should modify the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Personally, I think the most important criterion is that the patients respond to uh, dopaminergic stimulation, and I think it's not so important whether they have one motor feature or two motor features. I think this response to dopaminergic replacement is very, very important. And the other thing is, from my point of view, we always think that there's only one reason for the onset of idiopathic Parkinson's disease. We do not consider that there may be various reasons. And I think there's uh, still a lot of research to be done in the near future to, to identify these perhaps various reasons for the onset of idiopathic Parkinson's disease. But there's a further question. So, uh, Dr. Lano from uh, New York. So I want to address Tony's last comment, what for? Because I think that's the heart of this issue. And the what for is, do you want to cure this disease? Or do you just want to march along the way we're doing now? We're marching along pretty well. And we have good treatments. In a world of Huntington's disease and Alzheimer's disease and MSA, in Parkinson's we do well. But we're awfully close to doing much better. Now, we published a paper a number of years ago, or not a number of years ago, last year, in which we showed that if you look at the autopsies of Parkinson's disease patients early, and someone mentioned that all the studies so far have been late, but if you look in the first five years, one of the things that catches your attention is within three or four years, there are no more dopamine terminals left in the brain in any of the patients we saw, none. So something is happening fairly early. And it only makes sense in a disease like this that if you're going to treat, you want to be able to treat early. And the evidence that this disease is accumulating and progressing is increasingly strong. So if there is a body of evidence, as Stuart Isaacson pointed out, where somebody comes in with REM behavior disorder, olfactory dysfunction, a positive pets, the chances that person has Parkinson's disease is really high. In today's world, where we don't have a neuroprotective therapy, that maybe doesn't make much difference. But we're living in an age where we may be very close to having drugs that can influence the disease. And as someone who's just done gene therapy with trophic factors where an entry criteria was you have to be five years into your illness, we may have by definition prevented the treatment from being able to work. You have to treat early, I think, if what you're looking for is disease modification. Tony, to treat early, I think you have to revise the definition. Well, I um, agree, of course, that we need to continue to move forward in our understanding of the disease, particularly in the context of its pathogenesis in order to develop neuroprotective uh, or disease-modifying agents. And to do that, we do need to identify who has got Parkinson's disease earlier. But at present, um, we can't do that. And I come back to your point, gents, that you made. I agree entirely what we need is, an, is a sensitive and specific biomarker. And we don't, we don't have that at present. And it will not be a clinical biomarker because they're not sufficiently specific. It will have to be either a biochemical biomarker that we have not as yet identified, or it will be a combination of biochemical and clinical biomarkers. <clears throat> So, Warren, I entirely agree. We do need to move forward with that process. We're, we're not there yet, but we must be able to identify individuals at an early stage in order to apply those treatments more. And as well to generate homogeneous populations for the clinical trials that we'll undertake with those. So I agree. But coming back to the original basis of the debate, is the traditional um, diagnosis or definition still reliable? I think the answer is yes for the clinical uh, arena, but not for the research arena where we still need to modify it. Yeah. 
I would just like to support your view, Tony. I think um, we are now in a very similar situation as multiple sclerosis researchers have been a few years ago where they had disease-modifying therapies and they had to bring basically the diagnosis to an earlier stage. And it was indeed the identification of the clinically isolated syndrome, which is a combination of clinical and biomarker definition. It, it includes basically the MRI as a biomarker. Uh, which brought the field forward and helped us basically to, uh, to alter the course of multiple sclerosis by maybe sometimes overtreating some of these patients. This is what you, the price that you pay, uh, that you become less specific when you go to these very early stages of the disease. But opening up the definition of multiple sclerosis helped basically um, to include many more patients in a disease-modifying strategy. Uh, I would like to respond to uh, what uh, Dr. Thomas uh, just said. Um, I think that this is very important, and uh, I think it, it, this is uh, what goes uh, now here in, in the lecture hall. I think we are talking about Parkinson disease, but we don't mean we don't mean a disease. We mean a syndrome. The definition, the brain bank criteria, define a syndrome, not a disease. We don't know what causes it. There may be many more causes than, than we can think of. Even the ones that uh, we think of uh, are not yet clear. I can enumerate uh, five or six different mechanisms leading to the, what we call the, the clinical phenotype of Parkinson's disease. And each of these will have to be addressed differently. So I wrote a paper uh, about this that uh, uh, Warren didn't like, but, uh, but I think uh, hopefully somebody else will. <coughs> Parkinson's disease is not a single disease in, as, as we mean by, by calling it a disease. It's not a disease, this is a syndrome. It can result from different causes. This is extremely important in terms of finding disease-modifying drugs or treatments uh, because uh, the same page, the same endpoints of uh, be it the clinical phenotype or the pathological phenotype can result from different pathways leading to it, each of which will need a different treatment approach. <laughs>